So last week we talked about uh, open-handed, the, the idea, the concept, the perspective was how we hold our world matters. Meaning this, that each of us hold a, a world, even each of us hold our lives, each of us have different things in our hands, even each of us have different gifts, different resources, different relationships. Every single person in this room has something in their hands. Um, some of us are carrying it heavy, some of us are carrying it light, some of us love what's in our hands, some of us feel like we've been dealt a bad hand. <laughs> But the reality is each of us have something and how we hold those things, how we use those things, how we leverage those things, how we invest those things, that matters. Our relationships are, in fact, we talked about four areas, our time, um, our talent, our treasure, and our testimony, that how we hold those things matters. This week, we're going to get a, a little bit deeper into the, the same topic, and we're going to pick up in a story. Uh, and so John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. So it says this, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's actually on his journey to Jerusalem where he's about to die on the cross. So Jesus is about to give his life. He's about to do the thing he's been known for for thousands of years that we celebrate at Easter, this death, burial, and resurrection. He's on his way there. But before that, he stops in Bethany where Lazarus was. Lazarus was the guy that, if you read the Gospels, was one of Jesus' really good friends um, he got really sick, Mary and Martha, who are Lazarus's sisters. So you got a little family dynamic there, Lazarus, Mary, Martha. His sisters called Jesus, said, Lazarus is sick. Jesus says, I'll get there in a few days. He gets there in a few days, Lazarus is dead. And they're like, you're too late, Jesus. Jesus said, whatever, I'm Jesus. I'll raise him from the dead. He raises him from the dead. And so Lazarus is a, is a famous character in the Bible. Jesus raised him from the dead. So this is after all that. So Jesus is now hanging out with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and it says, Jesus, there it goes, he raised it for that. So he says, he gave, they gave him dinner. And so they made a big dinner. They had a, 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 a feast. And Jesus, in, in essence, he knows what he's going to do. He knows he's, he's heading into Jerusalem. He's about to give his life. So if you think about this, this is one of the last moments that Jesus gets to spend with his friends. He, he, he's making his rounds and seeing the people he loves and spending a little bit of time with them before that happens. So it says, Martha served, which we, if you know the story of Martha and Mary, Martha was always serving, and Mary was always at the feet of Jesus. And Lazarus was with Jesus reclining at the table. I'm sure it's like some sort of thing. Anyone like Thanksgiving food? Y'all like turkey? Are you excited about turkey? Anyone not like turkey? I'm finding out there's, I thought everyone liked turkey. We've got some people who don't like turkey. Like, I didn't know that was a thing, but I've, I, someone told me the other day, it's like, I don't like turkey. I was like, what? That's a thing? I thought Thanksgiving. I'm excited about the, t the pies, though. Man, I'm, I'm a pie. Anyone a pie guy? Man, I'm a pie guy. You make a birthday cake, I'm like, no thanks. Cupcakes, no thanks. You put a pie in front of me, let's go. And so I'm sure it was like a Thanksgiving dinner. They're sitting around um, eating this big dinner, big party. Jesus is making these memories, having these conversations with his dear friends. It says that Mary, she took a pound of expensive ointment or perfume. And she, it was made from pure nard, and she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray Jesus, said this, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, the disciples, he was one of the disciples, so that being the treasurer of his ministry, if you will, he was in charge of the money. He used that to help himself from what was ever put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. So Jesus is speaking, he, he's speaking very plainly here. I'm, I'm about to die here. And we're gonna, she's going to use this, this perfume to anoint my body, to embalm my body. And it says, for the poor you will always have with you, but I will not always be there. You do not always have me. So in this story, you got two characters, Mary, who gives this extravagant gift. I mean, it's not just extravagant in, in essence of being costly, but it was a perfume. It, was, it smelled amazing. It says the whole house smelt this way. It's like this morning when I came in. For whatever reason, today I could smell Krispy Kreme everywhere. Like, I don't know, I don't know if it's the temperature of the room, maybe it was a little warmer in the lobbies and it kept the donuts a little warm and soft or something, but like, I, as soon as I opened the door, I was like, oh, Krispy Kreme's here. It's on, on, did you guys get a donut today, man? Uh, but, so I could smell it, and so this is, there's an aroma, it says the whole house, you just open a door and you can, what she has poured out has filled, this extravagant, smelled amazing. 
which in biblical times, historically, contextually, people did not smell good. People took baths like once a week, once a month. That was actually ritualistic that you would take baths not that often. They didn't have access to showers, running water, hot water. And then so she takes this, keep in mind, not super smelling good people, but takes this perfume, everything smells amazing. But she doesn't just pour it on Jesus, the head of Jesus, or the hands of Jesus, or take like a little brute and wrap it underneath, uh, you know, the little, what's the, what's the little old school man, my, my grandpa used to have it, the, uh, the aftershave that came in the g- green glass bottle, was that brute or Sierra? You know what I'm talking about, the old school one? Like, you know, just a little under the, that's what my grandpa used to do when he'd sit in the bathroom, he'd shave and I'd watch him, he'd splash a little under his chin. No, she dumps it on her as feet, right? No formal, no like, hey, let's be sweet about this, no, like, hey, there's like a right, like she, she takes it to his feet, which would have been the dirtiest part of his body. They didn't have shoes. They didn't have tennis shoes. They didn't have Air Maxes. They didn't have Jordans. They had been wearing sandals, and they walked everywhere, and there was no paved roads, no sidewalks. Everything's dirt. And so this, take a picture of what she's actually doing here. She takes something very costly and doesn't apply it there, but comes to his feet in humility comes to his feet in worship and starts dumping this perfume, this oil on his feet. And catch how she wipes this up, says that she wipes his feet with her hair. I mean, the humility in that moment, the worship in that moment, it was an extremely costly gift, 300 denarii. It was an extravagant gift. It was a gift of worship, a gift of humility. And Jesus actually recognized this in Mark. If you jump to Mark, he talks about the same story, Mark chapter 14. It says, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. So anytime anyone preaches the gospel, Jesus says this, what Mary has done will be told in memory of her. So Jesus says, this is important. I think it's, if Jesus says this is important, if Jesus says when we preach the gospel, we should memorialize or remember this moment in time and history, I think it's important for us to maybe today take a moment and just look at this story. And consider what it was that she was doing. It wasn't just the what that she gave. It wasn't just that it was extravagant or expensive. But it was also the how she gave it. The fact that she was washing his feet and cleaning his feet with this. And so you get this beautiful picture of just Mary's love and affection for Jesus. But then there's another character in the story, which is Judas. And Judas asked a question. I think if many of us in the room were, were honest... We, we might ask as well, Judas goes, is there not a better way to spend that money? <laughs> like we could take this perfume, we could go to town, we could go to a pawn shop or whatever and sell it 300 denarii and we could feed a bunch of people. We could go and we could feed a bunch of people. We could do something generous for someone else. Judas is asking a question, why wouldn't we do something different? Like is there not a better way to spend this gift? And here's this guy who seemingly asking an important question about stewardship, but was he really? Uh, it seems like, okay, he's being a good steward. Like, this is a great, great question. Like, someone needs to be asking that question until we know what Judas was about, until we know why he was asking this question. So Judas, in this, in this story, he's using his position and his perspective to judge the worship of Mary. Not just the generosity. I mean, that's what's the obvious in the story. But he's using his judgment, his perspective to judge the generosity, the worship, the submission of Mary. While at the same time, not even being a generous person himself. Casting judgment from a position and perspective of masqueraded holiness. I mean, he's walking around as if I'm one of the chosen 12. Like, I know how this should work. We could use that money. And then Jesus, in the story, we know that he already had his hand in the money bag. Uh, And so he's walking around in this masqueraded, Judas was concerned about the money, not because he cared for the poor, but because money had a hold of his heart. We talked about this last week, the treasure of our heart, critical of others while lacking conviction for himself. And I think this often happens in the talk, in the conversations of money conversations, like it's easy for us when we talk about money or we talk about people's spending patterns and we can do this. And in fact, I've had to repent as I was writing this message because I've done this before looking down the road at some of my neighbors and different things and go like, I wonder how they got that. I wonder how they afforded that. And, you know, like I know what they do for a living. You know, like, I don't, you know, that's a really nice car. Like, I, you know, we can sit there and we can, with our own personal critical perspectives, judge other people. And not only do we do this in our lives and our worlds and with our neighbors, 
maybe coworkers, maybe like, man, I wonder what they're getting paid. They got a nicer car than I do. Well, they just have one kid and you got four, John, you know, <laughs> that's the deal, you know? And so I have some sacrifices because I had a bunch of kids, um, you know, because I love my wife, I now don't get some nice things, you know, so that's how it works. But we can do that, right? We can look across with people we work with or people we go to school with or maybe people even we sit in rooms with like this and go, I wonder how they got that. I wonder, I wonder like, if we can, if we're not careful, be critical of them without having the same convictions that maybe they had that got them to that place. And this is what's happening with Judas. He's, he's critical of her without having the same conviction and the same perspective of who Jesus was to him. She saw Jesus as the savior of the world. He deserves everything I have. He, he, he has given me so much. What, what little I have, I'm gonna pour out on him. But Judas is over here going, but, but let's count it out. Conviction with critical, just a, just a different conversation. So today, I'm going to unapologetically uh, talk a little bit about money, and here's, here's why. Why are we going to talk about money? Because I believe this, as the church, we cannot allow our fear of perceptions keep us from teaching the truth. We can't allow our fear of what other people may think, what, what other people may say, keep us from talking about the truth. What does God's word say? Yeah. And in fact, in the church world, this is a big deal right now. Because if I write, I could write another question up here. Why should we not talk about money? <laughs> I could write that question up there and I could give you a big long list. Prosperity gospel. There's a, you know, this gospel that's been preached. In fact, there's a documentary on it on, on and Netflix. And I, I, if you watch it, I would encourage you to watch it, you know, tongue in cheek. Don't just assume the worst out of everyone. Um, don't be a Judas. Don't sit and watch something like that and just think you're better. You know, think about your own self, reflect on it. But when you watch it, though, there's some pretty crazy stuff. And so there's been a, a gospel that's been taught that if you give this, then you get this. And, and that's not necessarily something we see biblically. We see that when we give, that God honors when we sow, that we reap. But we don't always sow and, and reap in the same season. We don't always sow uh, this seed and reap that plant. Like God has different ways. In fact, Scripture says that God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours. So sometimes we think, well, I buried an apple seed. I should grow an apple tree. And God goes, no, I'm sending you some pears, John, because that's what you need. <laughs> you know. And so, so when we talk about giving, and if we're not careful with the prosperity gospel, we think, well, if we give some money, if we're generous people, then that means we should be rich. And so I'm here to tell you today, if you're a generous person, that doesn't mean you get to be rich. That's not how that works. In fact, last week we talked about the widow's might. She gave everything that she had and Jesus honored her. We have no story or recollection that because she gave that, she won the lottery the next day on her, you know, at the gas station. Like We don't know that she became rich because of that. All we know is that she gave and got honored. But we also see in scripture when Jesus talks about treasure, when he talked to the rich young ruler, when he talked to Zacchaeus, he told them their treasure. When he said treasure, he said your treasure in heaven. And so some of our reward, if you want to look at the prosperity gospel, is not just I sowed here, so now I get to reap here. Some of what we sow, we don't reap until later in life. And I'm not just talking about five years from now, I'm talking about eternity. Because as believers, we have an eternal perspective. So when we give, we're not just going, God, I'm giving you this, so I get this. God, I put 50, 50 cents in the Jesus you know, vending machine, so give me some Twinkies, or give me a new car, or help me pay off this debt. That's not necessarily how it always works. But that's one of the reasons why a lot of people won't talk about money. Because the prosperity gospel got so rich and tainted that there was people, even I did it a few times, I gave and I asked God for something in return. Like I put something in the offering, God, I really need you to do this. <laughs> you know, and so, there, so that's a reason why not. Another reason why not is because there are some greedy pastors in churches out there. There are some people that are asking for you to give so they can buy another jet. I, I promise you, I do not have a jet. Um, nor do I have a gold-plated toilet. Um, I don't have anything. I drive a 2004 F-150 with 121,000 miles, and I love it. You know, and so, so like, we're, there, but some, some of us, like, when we talk about this, it can get a little weird because we know some stories. The interesting thing is we know some stories of maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 people. When I can tell you today, there's about 20,000 pastors in the United States who are serving, all mostly underpaid, and doing it because they love people like you and they love their cities and they feel called to the ministry. But so if we're not careful though, because of a few people, we cannot talk about what the Bible says. 
because of perspectives of a few. Another reason we wouldn't talk about this, because one's just uncomfortable. I would rather preach on healing, peace. I'd rather preach on end times. I'd rather preach on speaking in tongues or something weird that, like that. I would rather do any of that than this. Because the uncomfortable nature of this, sometimes we just don't talk about it. Sometimes there's abuse or misconceptions. But I think the reason that we have to talk about it today, and it's just one day, people, don't, don't get scared. This is not an eight-week series. Um, but the reason we have to talk about it today is because we can't allow the fear of perceptions to keep us from talking about some truths that I believe are in God's word. So here's, here's what we know. We talk about money. We talk about resources because Jesus talks about it. In fact, 25% of the words that Jesus spoke on had to do with finances. 25% of his stories. Over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible talk about our possessions, how we handle what's in our hands. And God cares about what we do with what's in our hands. If God cares about it, then we should care about it. And so the interesting thing is, is, as I was thinking about this message and kind of talking about, or talking about it with my wife and just talking, thinking through what we're going to cover today, I was thinking, you know, tithers, people who, who tithe or give regularly to a church, they don't have a problem with this message. They sit in a room and they go, amen, pastor. Like the people that, that typically this rubs the wrong way are the people who aren't real sure. They don't, maybe they haven't got a true teaching on it. Maybe they're not sure what they believe on it. Maybe they're just against giving money to churches in, in general. So there's a group of you in a room that today you're going to be like taking notes and amen. And there's a group of you today that are going to be like, I'm not quite sure, Pastor. And that's okay. That's why I'm teaching this instead of preaching this. So we're going to cover a lot of scriptures. And I'm going to let you draw some conclusions yourself. But we're going to look at, I believe, that I believe there's three ways, three ways, three types of giving in the scripture. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so... Let's just jump into it. Three types of giving in Scripture today. The first one, three types of giving that we're going to see in Scripture is obedient, which is what we call the tithe. And so the tithe, what is the tithe? The tithe is this. It's, it's a word, um, a Greek word, um, manasa, which just means 10 or 10%. So the tithe was in, 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 in Scripture, we're going to look at this, was an obligatory offering from the law of Moses, actually even before that, from Abraham, requiring 10% of the Israelites' first fruits because God provided the harvest. So this first part of the harvest they brought back to God. And it was a reminder to Israel that everything that they have is from God anyways. But in this, that's, that's the, the definition we get from Moses. But we're actually going to show, I'm going to show you uh, four different scriptures. I'm going to show you one that's pre-Moses. That, so pre-Levitical law, so if you've ever heard it taught as being the Levitical law, and now we're no longer under the Le Levitical law, the reality is tithing actually happened before that. And not only that, Jesus talks about it in the New Testament. So we're going to look at four different places in the Bible. First one's Genesis. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I will give my bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar or an altar shall be God's house, and of all that you give, I will give a full tenth to you. So this is the first instance that we have. This is a conversation between Abraham and God where Abraham says, I'm going to give 10% back to you, or Melchizedek actually. I'm going to give 10% back to you. So this is Genesis. I'll show you another one. This is one that you've probably all heard if you've been in church. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So this is scripture right here in Malachi. In the Leviticus, here's it from the Moses law, the, the Levitical law. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So now we're going to jump to the New Testament here. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. <laughs> so this, again, this is a scripture talking about really the heart of the tithe. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, uh, which that's like, I, those are three unique herbs. I'd hate to see them in, together in a dish. That would be pretty funky. Got a little Hispanic flair, a little uh, Greek flair, then I don't know, mint. I don't know. But three separate herbs that he says, for you tithe these things, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. So he said, you've done the things that, that, that the word teaches us to do. You've lived in accordance to those, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Those you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus says, you should tithe. 
That's important. Good job, guys. But you've done it without justice and mercy and faithfulness. What is he speaking? He said, you should be obedient to the word. Yes, Mary. You should, you should be sacrificial in your giving, but also it's the heart that matters. Like justice, mercy, faithfulness. It's not, just, it's not just an obligation. It's not just an exchange of goods. It's not just a duty. It's not just a command. In fact, Jesus talks about this a little bit later. He talks about, says that we should be cheerful givers. So he's speaking to these Pharisees about the heart of which they give. So the question in tithing, if we see this through scripture, this idea of 10% that we give back to God, this idea that we, that we tithe to God, it, it, the question of tithing isn't whether it's warranted scripturally, but the question really comes down to this, will I return it obediently? So tithing, it, when we look at this, is not a suggestion. Like we see scripture, not just Levitical, because that's how I grew up in teaching that, but as I started studying the word, I recognized it, started, it was happened before that, and not only that, it's been happening after that. And if you really want to get specific, the Levitical law, and even as we go further into the New Testament, Levitical law was more like 25%. Because they tithe of their finances, 10% of their finances, but then they had certain, certain tithes, or not tithes, but gifts that they were supposed to give of their crops, of their livestock, and then they even paid a temple tax. How would you like that when you come to church? You're just taxed 8% off the top. Like, you got a sales tax, and like, you want to come in today? You got to pay the tax. That's what they had. They had a temple tax set up. Aren't you thankful we don't do that anymore? That'd be weird. Um, and so, so this is, this is, this is, that's what they had. So they, in this Levitical law, they had about 25% that they would give regularly back to God. Now, if you fast forward that to the New Testament, uh, when Jesus was talking to these Pharisees and Sadducees, they were closer to 33% because they took what God had written in the law and they added some of their own flavor to it, which Jesus called out in them multiple times for all the stuff they added to the, these Pharisees and said these extra laws and rules that they wrote in. So they were up at 33%. But then if you go to the book of Acts and you see when an early church is formed, this is what it says. It's interesting. And this is why I really like a tithe covenant <laughs> because it says the church took everything that they had and put it together in common. And then they split it up to make sure all the widows and the orphans were fed and taken care of. So 10% starts sounding a lot better than putting everything we have in one pot. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. So this, in this, though, we see it's, it's just a baseline. This, this 10% that we see, the tithe is a baseline. It's an obedient baseline that we can see. There's a narrative all through Scripture in this. So do we, I, I think really what this comes down to when we're looking at it from an open-handed perspective is do we view our finances as God's or ours? Because if we view it as God's, I think that changes maybe how we view this. It's not, now the tithe is not conversational, it's not philosophical. It's not even like a theological conversation. It comes down to an obedient conversation. Am I going to obey what God's word says or am I not? Is this really God's resources or is it mine? Do we, it, do we trust God with our eternity and our pocketbooks or just our eternity? God, I want to be saved, but I'm going to run my own bank account. Or do we trust God with what he's done and what he has done and continues to do and also trust him in our everyday life? And so tithing then, if I could change maybe your perspective on it, is not giving 10%. Tithing is receiving 90%. And I think this is, the, this, is the, this is where we get into like a heart conversation because it changes the perspective. Instead of me coming and saying, God, I'm going to give this to you like you asked for it, now I'm going, God, thank you for the 90 the 10 is what you've already asked for. I take it, I set it aside. In fact, the way that me and my wife do it is we have it taken right out of our paycheck every week. It's just automatically, and this is what Moses would call first fruits. It talks about that in Proverbs 2. Solomon talks about that, the first fruits. So before anything else, it comes out first. Um, but if it comes out second or third, I think that's okay as long as your heart is okay um, in that. But that's, so it changes the perspective. I don't see it as me giving back to God, but me receiving something from him. Rick Warren tells a story, he's a pastor in California, of a dad who, who uh, took his kid, his like four-year-old, to McDonald's, and his kid wanted uh, fries and a milkshake, and that's a good snack right there, I don't know about you guys, but uh, fries and a milkshake, I could do that. Um, so he takes his kid, and his kid gets a, a fries, and there's, a, there's this thing called a dad tax, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but <laughs> before you pass it to the back, you take a bite out of it, or a drink out of it, and you're like, you just got to make sure it's all okay, it's it's really a sacrificial thing we do as dads. 
uh, to protect our kids. We don't know who's making that food. We don't know whose hands have been on it. You know, we just got to do it. And so with the, the, the dad forgot to take the dad tax. He passed the fries back, passed the milkshake back, driving down the road. And, and as a dad, all of a sudden you're like, I'm not going to do that. I've been eating salads this week. I've been drinking my protein shakes. But then you smell those salty, greasy fries in the back. So his dad asked his son, says, hey, buddy, can I get one of those fries? Give me a handful of those fries. And his son goes, no. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, there's this moment inside of a dad's head that it seems like it's a 10-minute conversation, but really it's like five seconds of just pinging all over the place. And a dad faces, and every dad has faced this, and probably moms you've faced this too, is that you have, there are no fries. You have no fries. I have fries. I gave you fries. And so the dad is thinking, like, how do I explain this to a four-year-old that those aren't his, those are mine, and I'm just letting him hold them right now. They're temporarily his. And then, I could, then the next thought that hits his mind is, I could take those away if I wanted to. I'm a grown man. You're a four-year-old kid. In fact, you're strapped to your seat. <laughs> you know, I reach back there, grab those. You're stuck. What are you going to do? You know, and so the dad's thinking this thought. Then he, the next thought is like, you know what? I could just go back to the drive-thru. I have more money than what I care to admit. And this guy wasn't rich. He was just, when it comes to fries, he could buy a lot of fries. Anyone in a room like that? You may not be rich, but you could buy some fries today. Come on. <laughs> And so he felt rich in that moment. He was like, why am I going through this whole like, thing in my head, like arguing with my four-year-old? It's all in his head. He's not saying any of this out loud, thank God. Or his kid would be messed up maybe. But he's got this whole conversation going on, and he's thinking about all these things. And at the whole time, he's like, I could just go back to the drive-thru. I could order myself a large fries or a super-sized fries. I get myself a 32-ounce milkshake. I could do that because I have all the resources. And then it was in that moment that that, that that dad had a revelation of how God views him. That, and I think if we, if we think about it, like God has all the fries he can need. Like, and so as we think about tithing, we think about generosity, we think about money. We're like, what does God really want from me? What does God really need from me? If God wants more of something, he'd just make it. In fact, he created the whole earth just by speaking a few words. So if God wants some more fries or if God wants 10% of your income or whatever, God could just speak it and have it. In fact, heaven tells us, John saw some pictures of heaven, says that streets were lined with gold, like so he could just go take a, a hammer and, you know, chisel up some of his, his pavers in his driveway and have more money if he needed it. I mean, this is the kind of God that we serve, so it's not a resource thing, and he is thinking about, you know, this this idea like, well, I got it and I gave it to you, why are you unwilling to, to give me just a few fries? And all of a sudden he started thinking, man, I'm like that sometimes with God. Like God has blessed me so much and there's times where I feel like God is asking me to do something or maybe asking me to speak to someone or asking me to encourage someone or, or share my faith with someone. Or maybe God is asking me to give sacrificially or maybe just obedient in a tithe and I'm sitting here going, ah, I gotta be more prepared. I gotta, I gotta work up to it. And he's, he's, I started thinking about all the parallels that he had. And, and here's, the, here's the reality is that God doesn't need our fries or our money. It all belongs to him anyways because he is the source of all French fries. You know, he's the source of all things. And so when we have a proper perspective of God as him being the source, as him being the resource, as him being the provider, the creator of everything, then it's a little bit easier for us to have this type of a perspective. It's a little bit easier for us to walk around open-handed. So second, that's the first type of giving. The second type of giving that scripture talks about and we have, I've got a scripture to talk about this, but then there's some stories in the Bible. Um, I don't think I'll have time to, but some different stories that we could talk about that. The second type of giving a scripture is sacrificial, which would be called an offering. So we have the tithe, which is an obedient giving. And then we have a sacrificial giving, which is an offering. This is when maybe you've done this before, when maybe you pray and you ask God, what is it that you would have me to give? <clears throat> the tithe is not something you pray and ask God about because he's already asked for that. And so it's just a matter of do I obey or not? But then this is something where I go and I go, God, what is it? it? God may be asking me to do something different, in fact, than maybe he's asking Ryan to do. God may be asking me to do something different than maybe he's asking Jenny to do. God may be asking me to do something, so I've got to hear from God. This sacrificial giving is something that, that God inspires us to do. It doesn't have a specific amount attached to it. it it's when we see that God honors and recognizes our, our obedience to his voice our obedience to hearing from him and honoring what he's given us in our hands. This is less about how much I give 
and more about, if we remember the quote from Charles Spurgeon last week, how much I have left. And so, here's a scripture for this, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So second type of giving we see in Scripture, there's no specific amount. In fact, it says the way that, that Paul describes it here to the church in Corinth, he says that he, each one has to give as he has decided, each one of you, each one of me, meaning specific individuals. So I'm not getting up here and saying all of you should do this. What I'm asking is that there's moments and times that maybe we, we pray and we ask God, what is it you're calling me to give? And this is obedient. This is sacrificial. But this is you hearing from God. This is God speaking to you and, and God asking you. And you have to decide in your heart what it is that God is calling you to give. We have to see, <clears throat> seek God. Here's the, here's, here's the hard part with this one, though, is that we have to seek God in our hearts to hear what he has to say and to know what he wants us to give. So some of us maybe have never even given in this capacity, never even thought about this capacity because we never talked to God about our finances. We've never had conversations say, God, what is it you wanna do? We ask God for things in our lives. We go to God and say, God, would you heal this? God, would you fix this? God, would you work in this way? And I think God loves to hear those prayers. He's not, it says that God hears our prayers. He, he, he's, he has an ear turned towards us. But I wonder if we've asked God things like, God, I've, I've got this job situation. I could not just use your help because my boss is a jerk, but I would love to make some more money because I'd love to give some more. Or, or God, there's this thing that I would love to be a part of, but like, have we asked and brought God into that part of our lives? Because this is what it says, as each of us has decided in our heart. And so this is why in this phrase, this is where we actually get the scripture, and this is where we actually get the phrase, having a heart for the house. This is, this is what we're gonna be talking about next week. This is not tithing for us. This is us asking, this is why we call it an annual vision miracle offering, because this is us asking God, God, we, we have baseline things in the church that we wanna do. We have things that we feel called to do, like Sunday services. We're, we've, been having, we've started our youth group up in the last you know, six, seven, eight months, and it's been going great, and we've been having a blast with that. Like We wanna do more of those type of things. There's certain ministries, parachurch ministries, that we're just gonna do because we're a church. Uh, we're working in conversations. We're actually, our offices are here. If you've seen it, our sign, we got a permanent sign up on the building, which is amazing. Yeah, and we're working on having more permanency in this, in this facility where it's more of our control instead of us working around everyone else, where we'd be primary tenants. So we're working on those conversations. Well, that's just regular church business. Like, that's just us being faithful, taking our next steps as our church is growing, thinking about how we're adjusting our service. Now, it's just, that's just us doing church. But then there's other things that we want to do. Like, there's the Easter outreach that we did last year where we, we, we ended up doing, was it? How many eggs was it? 20,000? Yeah, yeah 20,000 Easter eggs, and we, which was a good thing because we ended up having almost 1,000 people show up and hunt eggs at Edgemore Park. That was an extra thing. Here's what's cool is we didn't come and take an offering for that because at Heart for the House, we said, hey, we're all going to ask God what is it that he wants to speak to us, and then we gave sacrificially, and then when that time came around, we just did it. Like, we weren't taking eight, I don't know if you've been a part of church, I've been a part of church like this, take eight special offerings a year. It feels like every time the pastor's up, he's asking for something else, that if we don't do it, we can't do it. I don't like to do that, 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 that way. I want to give you guys one opportunity a year where you can jump on and say, hey, here's some things that we feel called to do, but it's going to be a little bit extra. Like, for us to, to have an Easter egg hunt for a, a thousand people, it's going to cost, for us to do a serve day and completely remodel this school right here, Minahaw, and redo their park and redo their playground and redo this, all, all this stuff, like put in, uh, we put in landscaping, all this incredible, like we didn't, act, we didn't take an offering for that. Why? Because we had already sacrificially given to do some of those things throughout the year. So this is how we approach this. That's why we call it heart for the house, because we have to hear in our own hearts, what is it God's calling us to do? And so this is how I'll present this, and we'll talk a little bit about this next week, is that, we'll, that, that the mission and vision of EMA will move at the pace of our hearts and our generosity. And so we'll go as fast as we can go or we'll go as slow as, it doesn't matter because we're just going to be obedient and walk this thing out. That's why we call it heart for the house. So here's the third type of giving is this is what I call purposed giving. So we first we have obedient giving, which is the tithe. 
Then we have sacrificial giving, which is the offering. And now we have purpose giving, which is the gift of giving. Do you know that there's actually a, a spiritual gift of, of generosity? Romans, Paul talks about this in Romans. He says this, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. What does that mean? It means each one of us have a different gift. So what we're talking about here may not be all of us. All of us, I believe, are called to tithe. All of us, I believe, that God can speak to us to give sacrificially, but that's going to look a little bit different for each one of us. But not all of us necessarily have this gift of giving. This is a spiritual gift. Each one of us have different gifts. So Paul says, let us use them. If, if it's to prophesy, do it in proportion to your faith. If it's service, do it in serving. The one who teaches, do it with teaching. The one who exhorts, let him exhort and encourage. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So in these gifts, right here, Paul says, there's a spiritual gift of contribution. There's a group of people that they actually have this purpose. Their purpose in life, in fact, is this gift of giving. So here we're not talking about tithes. We're not talking about offering. We're talking about people who actually believe that their calling in life is to be generous. And there's a group of people that are like this. That this and <clears throat> I'll tell you a story about it in just a second. The, the gift of giving, though, I, I think it's important to note this, that it has little to do with your income, and it has more to do with how you spend it. I think that the widow might, that, that story we read last week, I think that lady had a gift of giving. I don't think Jesus was looking at her and go, you're going to build a new hospital. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. He wasn't looking at her as a resource for millions of dollars, but she had that. It was something inside of her called. There was no, no one told her she needed to give all that she had. Something inside of her spoke. Something inside of her had purpose. Something inside of her had calling that says, I'm going to do this today. And this is a gift of giving. So it's not just the rich people. So I'm not talking to people who have more than others. And I think in our society, that's often how that's painted. It's like, well, if you have more, you should give more. Well, I believe the gift of giving can be people who are just regular people, people who God speaks and they find purpose in their giving. Um, so what does the gift of giving look like? Acts, we see this, uh, Barnabas says, Joseph, who was also called the apostles, by the apostles Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and bought, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas sells a field takes all of the resources. doesn't say 10%. doesn't say half. It says he sold a field and he brought all of those resources. And see how he did this. He laid it at the apostles' feet. He didn't walk into a meeting and say, hey, everyone, I want to make an announcement. I'm a really generous guy and I'm going to pay this next thing. In fact, will you call this building the John Morris building? You know, like, and not that that's bad, it's good. Like build buildings, help us do stuff like that. There's great things. But this guy didn't do that. This is what he says. So he laid it at his feet. He presented it humbly, much like Mary, the feet of Jesus. Yeah. And so this gift of giving is, I believe, what Mary showed us in that moment. She wasn't tithing to Jesus. She wasn't being obedient to Jesus. Jesus didn't walk in and say, Mary, feet. You know, it wasn't anything like that. There was no, I don't think it was just sacrificial, even though it was sacrificial. I believe in her heart, the way that she presented it, taking her hair and wiping the feet of Jesus, what we see is some, someone that had the gift of giving. And so I, I, when I think about this, I can think of several people in my life that have had the gift of giving. My dad is one of those people. My dad is a super generous guy. Um, he might be watching this later, so sorry, Dad, I'm going to tell a story about you. I didn't ask permission. You're my dad. Um, so, but my dad is a super generous guy. I've grown up with him. But um, as a kid, I remember when we moved to Fort Smith, Arkansas, I was three or four years old. My dad bought his first mechanic shop. Bought an Exxon gas station, had two car garage and like a little bitty front kind of gas station area where you can like reception area, whatever. And I remember as a kid, like growing up there and my mom would go down to, to KFCs and they used to have these little chicken sandwiches they put on a roll and they call them chicken littles. Anyone remember chicken littles? Anyone else old like me? Yeah. Um, now we call them sliders. Um, <laughs> we're fancy now, we're bougie, but we call them chicken littles when I was a kid. And I remember she'd buy a bag of those, and I thought we were rich because we just had chicken little stacked up on this little coffee table. And me and my little brothers would sit down on our knees, and we'd just slam those things. I mean, just, I'd eat three or four of them. I thought, man, if we have 10 of these piled up, how much money do my parents have? You know, like, how do you have a stack of sandwiches like that? I can't even go and buy one. Of course, I was six. 
But, you know, I was just sitting there thinking. I remember the perspective of my, my parents, of my family, because of those stack of sandwiches. You know, what's interesting, those were, I think, back then, they were like two for a dollar. So the, the value for me was huge, right? Because the stack of sandwiches. I'm going, oh my gosh, this is insane. The value for my dad, who had just started a business and moved his family a couple hours south, was thinking, this is probably all I can do. Isn't it interesting how even we can see things differently? How our perspectives and our stories and our experiences see resources differently? My dad is going, this is what little I have to give to my kids. And I'm going, look at all these sandwiches. You mean I can have as many as I want? Yeah, can I come back and get one later? I can only eat three now. Like, this is insane. But I, I remember watching my dad grow up and, and watching him continually over and over again from that moment when I was a young kid to even now, him just give things away. And in fact, most of the vehicles that we've owned as we've been in ministry and in pastors for a long time, most of the vehicles that we've owned, my dad has basically given us. And the nicest vehicle that we own was basically given to us. But not just his kids. I watched him at Christmas one year. Sorry, Dad, I'm telling stories on you. My dad's going to be so upset. He hates this stuff. Um, but he watches every sermon, so I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> but I remember at Christmas one year, he, he, I was working with him. I was like 14, 15 years old. He's like, hey, we got to leave early. we got to go stop by the store. It's like, okay. And so we go to this, to go to Walmart Supercenter. And in Arkansas, they're different than in Kansas. Let me just tell you. They're like malls. Like, they're <laughs> huge. That's where Walmart's from, by the way. And so we're going to this Walmart Supercenter. And we, like, he tells me to get a cart, and he's got a cart. I'm like, man, what are we getting? Like, this is going to be fun. And we just start filling this thing up with food, pizzas, turkeys, hams, milk, bread, all kinds of stuff. And then we take the next cart and we go into the toy aisle and he tells me three ages of three different kids and we start just piling up this cart with toys. And I'm sitting there, I'm doing the math. I'm like, this is kind of close to my age. Like, is any of this mine? Like, you know, like, that's my kind of, are we shopping for my brother? Like, I was trying to figure it out. And so we literally filled up, the, we had one of these old Suburban, Chevy Suburbans, and we filled up the back of this thing, I mean, all the way to, I mean, the back, laid the back seat down, completely full of food and, <clears throat> and presents. And we pull up to this guy's house that had gone to church with us, and my dad calls him out and says, hey, we got something we want to give you guys, you know, we just want to bless your family, you know, it's been a tough year. And this guy just started a new business and was really struggling. And so we took all of those toys and put them in the trunk of his car in the parking lot at Walmart. And then put all the groceries in the front seats, or the parking lot of the church, excuse me, in the front seats. And I watched this guy bawling, giving my dad a hug, and he's like, well, I'm going to tell my kids that, you know, Uncle John or whatever they call, wanted to call him, that, that John, the guy fixes our car, because this was just a guy that was a customer of my dad's, that John bought this. My dad would not, said, no, these are from you. These are from you for your kids, and, and I want you to do this for them. And I watched that as a, as a kid, just watching my dad do things like that, not just once, but over and over and over again as a mechanic. Not as some wealthy millionaire, not as some CEO of something, just a mechanic. But I've also watched God bless his business over and over again. He's not walking in some corner of Exxon anymore. He's got a giant shop that holds about 30 cars and works on diesels and fleet vehicles. And I watched God bless his business. And I've never, as a kid, a six, oldest of six kids, we brought in three foster kids through most of my high school. We had nine to 12 kids in our house most of my life. <laughs> Pretty crazy. I never didn't have what I needed. I played basketball. I watched God provide in miraculous ways as I watched my dad give sacrificially over and over and over again. Why? It's a gift of giving. There's certain people that are just wired that way, that find purpose in that. It's not because they have more. It's just because how they see what God has placed in their hands.